Hey hey, Marcus Haas with you here. Today we are going to build the ultimate asteroid hauler. Before that though, I have been able to stumble on this contract here. This is going to be to take a class E asteroid all the way to Gilly. Now, this is a good thing to do when we're building an asteroid hauler vessel, so why not? We'll pick this up and move on here. This is worth over 2.3 million in funds on completion with another 767,000 advance. So first things first, we need to actually find a Class E asteroid. Now the Class E is the largest asteroid type, which is why I've chosen this mission. So we have one selected and tracked. Now we can check out our vessel here, which of course, like anything I've built lately, is massively over-engineered. Check out the huge number of Nerve rocket motors on this thing. It's really as many rocket motors that I can fit within a fairing, so let's see how this thing goes. This thing has quite a heavy payload, so we are launching this with five mammoth cores. Now the first thing you uh, want to do here when doing such a thing is try to figure out which way your asteroid is going to be coming in. So you can see here it's actually coming in in a retrograde direction, so we need to actually get into a retrograde orbit of Kerbin. Launching here now, and as you will see, the thrust to weight ratio on this thing is quite high. We're going to be able to start our gravity turn quite quickly. We have the four outside boosters here hooked up in an asparagus staging type of arrangement here. Dropping the first two boosters there, these are now empty of course, leaving our three remaining tanks fully fueled. Obviously this mission is very sped up in the footage, we've got a lot to cover in this very short episode. The next two cores are almost empty so we are going to ditch these two as well now. This now leaves us with our one single core stage booster here, which is going to get us up well past orbital velocity. Now what you'll notice here is I'm not leveling out to the horizon as early as I normally would, and this is essentially because I want to raise the apoapsis way up, and I actually want to leave the periapsis quite low, and this is going to allow the booster to actually come back and impact back on the surface without leaving all of that debris around, which you know I hate very much. So the solar arrays are deployed and we'll ditch that booster stage. Now of course we just need to make sure that we raise our periapsis instead of ourselves falling back into the atmosphere. We don't want to do that. So we're just going to raise it up just enough so that we don't pass back through the atmosphere. Now we have a good shot here of the Nerve rocket motors without the booster stage attached. So there are 40 separate Nerve rocket motors here. This thing for a Nerve rocket motor stage has got a massive amount of thrust. You can literally wipe off hundreds of meters per second very, very quickly. This is overpowered simply because we want to be able to push massive asteroids around with fairly minimal effort. There's nothing worse than having to sit there for minutes and minutes trying to move an asteroid by just a few meters per second. So we're at quite a high circularized orbit. We're just going to do a quick inclination change here to match our asteroid. And we can now just time warp in until our asteroid is just about to come in and enter Kerbin's sphere of influence. Now, this is always the tricky part, trying to actually get your encounter with the asteroid to match up with your orbit. So this is why it's important to have quite a low orbit around Kerbin so you can tweak your exit burn so that you're going to eject out at the right time so that you can catch your asteroid. So that maneuver node there is set up pretty well. We'll time warp around now until it's time to do our ejection burn. This is quite a few orbits away. And now we just need to do a short burn of just over 180 meters per second. It's only going to take around 17 or 18 seconds on these nerve rocket motors. Now just because we have our intercept quite close, that doesn't mean we can't get closer. So we are doing another mid-course correction burn here just to match this up even more closely. So we're just going to time warp in now to that intersect marker. Then of course we are going to turn retrograde in relation to our target and we're going to wipe off all of that relative velocity. So we're still around 10 kilometers from the asteroid there. We're going to do a quick burn towards the target and wipe off that distance. So interestingly, there was no actual marker appearing for the asteroid there. So I had to jump into map mode to see where it actually was. And you can see here, uh, I finally caught up with it. Still no marker appearing, but as I approached, I realized that this is no regular asteroid. 
targeting the center of mass and will dock with this thing to do some research on what appears to be a very rare, mysterious element of some sort or another. Perhaps this element will be used for future glow-in-the-dark toys for Kerbal Kids. So far we are meeting our contract requirements, we need to now get this thing to Gilly. To do this however we need to refuel ourselves, so luckily we have uh, added to this vessel all of our drills, our radiators and of course our Convertitron unit. Oh, and of course we have Astris, our five-star engineer, who gives us a huge increase in drill speed. So thank you, Astris. And you can see they're using our vector engines. We can actually spin the asteroid reasonably quickly using our RCS if we need to. So we're just quickly going to drop this down into an actual orbit of Kerbin so that we don't escape the sphere of influence. And we're just going to zero out our inclination here around Kerbin so that when we eject out to EVE, we're at least ejecting out quite level. Now I've got the moon selected as our target and you'll notice that we've got a, a negative uh, descending node there. This is simply because we have a retrograde orbit, so we basically want to make this negative 180 degrees. Just awaiting EVE to be at the correct phase angle and now we are going to set up our ejection burn to intercept with EVE and then of course Gilly. Now what we're going to do here is basically drop right down into Kerbin's gravity well and shoot out. Utilising what is called the O-Birth effect. This makes a very big difference to the delta V needed to get to another body. So always utilise the O-Birth effect if you can. So there we go, we are now on our way to EVE. The next thing we need to do is a slight inclination change. This is going to make sure that we come in nice and level, uh, essentially so that we can also come in and intercept easily with Gilly. So you can see here, Gilly is going to be orbiting in the opposite direction to what we are going to be coming in on. So we're just going to bring this right in so that we're coming in on the opposite side of EVE's orbit there. And just because we can, uh, let's let's try aero braking around Eve with this asteroid. Um, it's certainly going to save us a little delta V. Just got to get things lined up here correctly. There we go. So as we start time warping in towards Eve, we will of course kick those drills back into action. We'll make sure we're fully fueled before we enter Eve's sphere of influence. So time warping around here. Around another 72 days worth of waiting for Asteris. And in we come here, into Eve's sphere of influence. And holy crap, I forgot to turn myself around retrograde. Crap, 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 turn, 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 turn. Oh god, everything's overheating. Uh, that was extremely lucky to have not lost anything there. <laughs> How cool does that mysterious asteroid look there under extreme heat? <laughs> At least scientists on Kerbin will be able to do some analysis of what happens when extreme heat hits an asteroid like this. Zooming out here we can see how puny this thing is compared to EVE. Now that we're through the densest part of the atmosphere we are going to turn retrograde again and wipe off enough velocity to get us down into an orbit. We need to bring ourselves down to around 3,500 meters per second to bring us right down to Gilly there. This was of course a very massive burn. We needed to reduce the velocity of ourselves and the asteroid by almost 1,500 meters per second. As cool as passing through Eve's atmosphere was, that really only saved us several hundred meters per second in Delta V, nowhere near enough to bring us right down into an orbit. And this is simply because the asteroid just can't take that much atmospheric pressure before it explodes. So now of course working on our intercept with Gilly, and uh, obviously just trying to match our inclination here, we're around 12 degrees off. Remember, of course, if you are correcting at your ascending node, you are always doing an anti-normal burn. And the opposite, of course, uh, if you're at the descending node. So we've got the inclination there matched up. Now all we need to do is get our intercept. So we'll just lower here our apoapsis just so that we can uh, more easily, I guess, catch up with Gilly. Just a few meters per second made all the difference there. Now we should just be able to extend our periapsis there to meet up with Gilly on the opposite side of this orbit, so that there should do nicely. We only need a very small 35 meters per second burn here just to match up with Gilly. There we go. 
Just a very small adjustment there, and we'll time warp right into the periapsis of Gilly there as we're flying by. And of course, as we come in, we will turn retrograde, uh, fire our engines enough to just fall into an orbit of Gilly. Now, Gilly's orbital speed is just absolutely tiny. In fact, escape velocity from Gilly is only uh, just above 20 meters per second. So yeah, it, it takes virtually no effort to get on and off this thing. So there we go, contract complete, 2.3 million in funds there rewarded for doing this mission. So, hmm, what to do with this huge asteroid now? Maybe we should land it on Gilly. It's not going to be too hard to get down there. Uh, we've got more than enough thruster weight ratio to do this. So yeah, let's let's see if we can let's see if we can land this thing. Of course, moving at the snail's pace of only 20 meters per second, it took a long time to get down here. So skipped over all of that video so that we can actually show the landing without waiting for 15 minutes. And like I've done before with Gilly, I've forgotten to switch into surface mode, which usually happens automatically, so I'm just not used to actually manually uh, selecting that. So yes, I was slightly thrusting in the wrong direction, so trying to actually uh, come down here for some kind of touchdown that is actually going to stop the vessel from moving. The problem with Gilly, of course, is the gravity here is so low, uh, there's virtually no traction on anything. You just sort of keep floating around. Just a slight bounce will uh, will keep you moving along in some random direction. So after waiting quite some time for this thing to stop moving, I thought, oh bugger it, we'll just we'll just uh, yeah we'll go on an EVA. This thing can keep rolling around as much as it likes. We'll we'll find it again. So Astris Kerman, our engineer, she'll pop out here, plant a flag and grab a surface sample here from the highlands. We can return that to the craft of course and then we're going to head to another biome. Uh, just go on a bit of a journey while our asteroid there is just slowly rolling around. So just passing high here over the surface of Gilly. And uh, you can see actually we've already picked up a couple of milestones. We've planted a flag on the surface of Gilly and of course stood on the surface of Gilly. Again, the problem here with Gilly is that we can easily obtain um, escape velocity and we can just skip right out of, uh, of the sphere of influence, um, even just with our Kerbal. So yeah, we need to keep, keep thrusting downwards to, uh, to actually land again. So here's another biome. We are now at the lowlands. So we'll plant a flag there, grab another surface sample. And of course, if you're up here yourself, you can rinse and repeat this process for basically all the biomes on Gilly. You could do a full orbit of Gilly on your EVA pack very, very easily and uh, and come back and, uh, and board your vessel, obviously. Of course, if you are coming here for the first time, grab a little rocket chair or something with all of your science experiments loaded so you can pick up all that wonderful science at the same time. So after a very long journey, we are now back here at the asteroid and it stopped moving around, which is a nice to see. Uh, so we'll board this and actually, I think I forgot to grab the EVA report. I'll, uh, I'll quickly pop out, grab that. There we go. And we're about ready for liftoff, I think. We might just thrust off in the direction that we're leaning. No need to sit ourselves up in any strange way. It would have been quite hard to do so just with our RCS anyway, with a massive asteroid in front of our face. And look at that, only 29 meters per second and we are well past escape velocity for Gilly. So our mission is done here. Um, what are we going to do now with this thing? I think bringing our magical asteroid here back to Kerbin is probably the best thing to do. So obviously here we are setting up our escape burns to get back to Kerbin. Obviously here again we are utilizing the Oberth effect, we're dropping right down into Eve's gravity well to give us a very efficient transfer back out to Kerbin. If you are unsure about what the Oberth effect is all about, click the link that I've got here. This will explain just how powerful that Oberth effect is and why it works the way it does. There we go there, we have our intercept, just a few small corrections got us there to Kerbin. And after a very long time warp, of course, to get all the way back, all we need to do now is get ourselves back into an orbit of Kerbin. We're going to bring ourselves down here, just in between uh, the Moon and Minmus. So we're just preparing to turn retrograde and do that retrograde burn so that we can drop into this orbit. 
After all of this traveling with this huge Class E asteroid, there is still around 40% of the remaining uh, fuel to mine out of the asteroid itself. This should well mean that we've got a nice refueling station here if we need one in the future. Uh, and until then, we need to figure out a way to come and rescue Asterisk from this vessel so that she can go on a holiday. This has been a very large, long mission for Asterisk. But for now, she is going to contemplate her position in the universe as she looks back to Kerbin, hoping one day to get back home. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. Please do give us a second uh, and give us a thumbs up. All of your support helps a huge, huge amount. If you have any questions for me, please, of course, whack them down in the comments below. Uh, thanks very much, of course, to all of my wonderful subscribers. For those that haven't subscribed yet, why the heck not? Please do subscribe to see more. Follow me on Twitter at Marcus House Game, and we'll see you in the next video in those solar panels and launching. Obviously on Duna we can do our gravity turn pretty much as soon as we lift off. There's hardly any atmosphere to slow us down here so we're gonna punch straight out of the atmosphere very quickly. And there after 800 meters per second that's basically enough for now. We will wait until we transfer out to our...